I always do a self-recording as well, then, you know, in case there's a technical issue. That happens. We're technical people, right? This is how it goes. Okay. Those are redundancies. Yes, exactly. Hi. How is everybody? We have made it to the end of the day here at Drupal Camp, New Jersey. It is so nice to be here. This talk is called Understanding Technical Leadership. This is a brand new talk. I will not be held accountable for how this talk goes. And you all are guinea pigs. This talk is dedicated to those in service. I hope it applies to you. During this talk, I try to present various experiences I've had. I try to roll up the ideas or the concepts into something relatable or known what's in the world. And most importantly, I decided to solicit members of our community via Twitter to give me input for this talk. So as you see throughout the talk, you will find little tweets and snippets of tweets. Those are from all of our peers in the Drupal community. Awesome, right? So my name is Adam Bergstein. <laughs> this is a self-portrait of me at the beach, you know, merely weeks ago. I also go by Nerdstein. I am the Associate Director of Engineering at a lovely company called Civic Actions. If you're not familiar with us, strongly recommend you check us out. I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank uh, the committee, the camp, for having me. Uh, I'm very honored. Before we get started, I always try to come up with something I think that's related to the area or the place that I'm presenting. There's a guy that I think a lot of people know historically, uh, but in these times, I think we really need to be reminded of just how important and valuable diversity is to our success. This guy named Einstein, he became an American citizen in 1940, and he joined the Institute for Advanced Study right here in Princeton, New Jersey. How fitting is it that we're here today for all the innovation, the exchange of ideas, and the recognition of global diversity that our Drupal community represents. I think it's pretty cool. So thank you again for being here and listening to me talk. I hope it's not too boring. Here's a brief outline of what we're going to cover today. First, I'm going to try to make an effort to define what I believe a technical leader is. I'm going to start there. I'll share a couple characteristics that I've learned, discovered, and then I'm going to say, here are some lessons. Here are some direct things uh, rolled up to some concepts that we can explore, and I'll share some of my experiences all throughout. And don't forget, we have Twitter. Boom. Section number one, what is a technical leader? Well, I have some news for all of you. The best technical leaders are the ones that have experience, failures, insight, but they're not necessarily the best technicians. They're not purely technical people. It's not a position. It's not a job title. And my claim, and what I hope you leave here today, is that every single person is capable of being a leader regardless of your role. It is a conscious choice that we all are capable of making. You're able to use your experience to make the world better. That's why this talk exists. Every interaction you have, every code review that you do, every conversation, every co-working session that you have with a peer is a new opportunity for you to show leadership. There's a gentleman possibly sitting upstairs right now in the coding lounge who responded to me via Twitter and said, I think most, uh, most tech leadership doesn't relate to the actual technical skills. It's being a good example while being in a technical role. Hmm. Seems like a good segue. 
John uh, Buchan, in, back in 1930, wrote, the task of leadership is not to put greatness into humanity, but to elicit it for the greatness is already there. That's an awesome quote. Okay, that's really the pinnacle of what we're trying to, what I'm trying to share here. A leader is capable of bringing out the best in other people, period. You have to be selfless. You have to recognize the importance of being a leader in everything that you do. Most importantly, you probably need to recognize and remove your ego. Why? It's not about you. Consider your mission as a technical leader to create rock stars. That's how I look at the world and my job and what I do. You need to empower others to be great and to do great things. You need to be able to analyze every single individual's strengths and weaknesses and put people in a position that they're going to succeed. Heather Rodriguez also responded via Twitter. A good technical leader makes team members feel comfortable asking questions and admitting they don't know something. Hmm. A good tech leader is a mentor and offers help and advice so others can grow too. Pretty selfless, right? Who here has heard of uh, Mark Schwartz? Has anyone read any of his books? You should. It's good stuff. So Mark used to be, I think, like a CTO in a government agency for the US, but now he works for uh, Amazon Web Services. So Mark wrote a book called uh, A Seat at the Table. And Mark is definitely an innovator. Mark uh, challenges norms. He's been in leadership roles. And a seat at the table is a, a fresh perspective at looking at IT leadership. He really explores a lot around team empowerment. It's a really key concept that he hits repeatedly. And also looking at how that works with <coughs> Agile and DevOps and service. One key thing that he focuses on is his role in all of that. His claim is really that any person on the team can bring up anything innovative. And it's a very grassroots kind of thing. He acknowledges, like I think most leaders, that, that he's not the expert in things most of the time. This grassroots innovation can come from any single person on a team. They are the actual experts in the technology or the subject area. And that is really key to making sure that things go well. It's your job, I think, as a technical leader to encourage and incentivize people to raise ideas. I believe very strongly in that. And that's one thing that Mark talks about with incentivizing courage. Schwartz claims that it's not the role of IT leadership to command and control. You're not just an administrator that signs a check or that approves a project plan or does something like that. That's not it at all. The role really is supposed to be about harnessing ideas, proceeding with those ideas in a cautious and calculated way, challenging ideas to become measurable, to note progress, and not make big investments until things are proven. What that means to me is exploring risk. And looking at risk is only taking risks that are quantified and known, and trying to avoid ones that could really get you in trouble. <clears throat> Even smaller risks may be worth taking, because they could present opportunities for your team to grow and be their best selves and let them explore. <clears throat> One of the keys uh, to that, though, is making sure that you fail fast and you experiment rapidly. That's section one. Section two is about characteristics. And I think that I've learned some characteristics that I feel are worth sharing. And I want to note 
that these characteristics are not from one angle. It's not me being a technical leader. It's me observing other technical leaders. It's me being managed by other technical leaders. It, these are just observations across the board about characteristics. The first point I want to raise is around servant leadership. This is a concept I think that sometimes can get overlooked. Your entire job <laughs> as a technical leader is to serve, period. That's it. You need to ask yourself who it is that you actually serve. What, what are you doing, right? I work in uh, professional services. That's what I've done for a while. And when I look at who I serve, I look at two primary angles for that. One being, I need to make sure that I'm solving problems for my customers. That's one angle. The second angle is I, I need to make sure that I'm best representing my team and serving them well. So in, in my case specifically, my priority is to make sure that I am servicing them in all angles as much and as best as I possibly can. Larry Spears, uh, he's a CEO of a company I believe and uh, he identified 12 principles of servant leadership. He wrote them up in a PDF. If you Google it, you can find it. It's really easy, very similar to some of the ideas that Michael presented earlier in his talk. They were really great. Uh, and I'm just going to read them. We don't, I don't have time to get into the, the nitty gritty on all of these. But these, these uh, principles are really great for embodying certain perspectives that you might want to have uh, and, and raise some situ situational awareness uh, as being a technical leader. So what are these principles? One, you have listening, empathy, healing, awareness, I, that's a critical one, persuasion, conceptualization, foresight, stewardship, growth, building community, that's critical for us, calling, and nurturing the spirit. These are things that are really great guideposts that might help raise awareness for leadership. Uh, I saw this tweet. This wasn't in response to my tweet thread, or whatever we call those things nowadays. Um, but this was posted the other day, and, and I, it like really resonated with me. So uh, Steve Kinney, I'm not sure who he is, but it just came across my feed. Uh, he says, senior developers, and I would substitute technical leaders, or insert your job title here, right? Unblocking and being a force multiplier to the junior developers on your team is literally the most important thing you can and should be doing with your time. If you're crushing code while members of your team are stuck, you are actively hurting the team. Hmm. So what does that tell me? First, if you serve other people, imagine the impact that you are capable of having in the world if you are bringing out the best in other people. It's like the butterfly effect. You heard of that? One small action can have repercussions all around the world. So as an example, with the work that I do, I've always found that it's better to help coach people or sit down and co-work with them to try to produce results than it is for me to go and dive in and do the work for them. In the past, I have pushed commits to a developer's branch. I've done things like that. And I'll, I just said, oh, I'll handle this. Don't worry about it. But what I was doing is I was robbing them of the opportunity of learning and growing in the process. I failed them. The next point I want to talk about is empathy. If you haven't figured out already, every single one of us are in some journey in life. We are all in some state of learning. We have some knowledge in back-end coding, maybe a little less knowledge in front-end coding. We have DevOps stuff. It's a wide array of things. But every single person that you interact with will have some greater knowledge in some areas, some lesser knowledge in some areas, and that's all part of their journey 
that they have gotten to this point in their lives. So what about empathy? I have often found, and this is just me maybe being an optimist, but when people make mistakes, I don't assume that they wanted to. Right? So let's, let's look at this. So let's say someone picks up a ticket in your backlog, and they're trying to crank out some work, and let's just say they misunderstood a requirement, and they developed the wrong solution. I think there's two ways to respond to that situation. You could say, wow, you, you just wasted all this time. Dang, that's not cool. Or you know what you could say? You could say, hey, it's okay. I've done that too. Let's figure it out the right way next time. And what did you learn from this? We need to promote empathy we need to advocate for teaching others. We need to let them fail. And we need to pick them right back up when they fall down. I found that uh, the concept of blameless retrospectives is a great way to achieve some shared understanding and also to promote empathy. Daniel Rose, uh, he's a community member. He responded to my super tweeter thread. Having patience and being able to empathize and mentor newer team members. That was his response when I asked what makes for a good technical leader. Here you go. One thing that I have never appreciated is code reviews. I feel like we really really, as technologists, let people down with code reviews. There is such a lack of empathy <laughs> that people bring to that activity that I've never understood. This is not a competition. It is an opportunity to educate, to inform, and to help people. Period. This is never, never, never should be happening. WTFs per minute, that is not acceptable, right? Engineers often invest so much time into their work. They've overcome more challenges than you probably realize that they don't talk about, and things, they've explored unknown things that they didn't even realize they were gonna run into. And the end result is a pull request that they ask for your feedback. A code review should always maintain the tone of positivity, gratefulness for the effort that people made, and constructive feedback to help them improve. Period. Treat a code review as an opportunity to help someone learn from you. Let them iterate and move on. It's that simple. There's an underlying tone of everything that I'm saying here, and it's around continuous learning. If you haven't realized it already, you should always be learning, and you should be an advocate for making sure other people around you are always learning. As a technical leader, I think it's expected, or it should be expected, for you to contribute much of what you learn, if not as much as possible, all of it, if you can. How do you do that? Well, you write blog posts. You give demonstrations of cool work that you've explored on your weekend or your evenings when you have some spare time. And maybe you give presentations at camps and conferences sharing what you've learned. Hmm. Yeah, who's doing that? One of the key things about continuous learning is it's also still not about you, right? You need to allow other people to share what they've learned so that there is a continuous pipeline of feedback and ideas and growth among an entire team. Let them retrospect on what they're doing. You need to be comfortable both giving and receiving feedback too. This is critical, I think, for people to, to be a leader, honestly. 
if your commitment is to teaching as part of that feedback, I think that's a good perspective to have. And I believe, just me, that every single person that I've come across has a responsibility to help coach, mentor, and educate other people. So let's talk about an example that kind of resonates with, with this idea. First, I'll say that there was, a, uh, there was one time and wasn't really well prepared. I, like, didn't, we didn't have a lot of time to get stuff in order. Uh, a team member of mine ended up giving a failed live demonstration to a whole group of people. A uh, couple things occurred, you know, the technical demo failed, that was, was really not cool, but it happens, right? Um, and Slack notifications, they forgot to turn them off, getting tons of Slack messages right in the middle of the talk, you know? I was tempted to do one myself, but that's not very professional. Um, and, but the real key about it is, is, you know, when the person realized that that all had happened, and they knew it while it was going on, right? And they just didn't know what to do. That's a teachable moment. <laughs> you get on the phone afterwards and you talk through it and you say, hey, here's some things that I observed. You know, let's work on getting better. Let's capture this stuff in our handbook so we make sure that other people learn from this. And let's get it right the next time. Robert F. Kennedy has a nice quote. Only those who dare to fail greatly can ever achieve greatly. Hmm. Some people are scared to death of failure. They want to try and cover their basis as much as they possibly can. You know, failure can be scary. It can compromise profits. It can introduce risks to projects. So yeah, there are some downsides to failing. There's no question about it. But let me tell you folks, failure happens all the time, regardless of how much you try to protect it and avoid it. <laughs> it's gonna happen, period. We need to embrace failure as a key mechanism for learning. It is crucial. This helps people achieve great things now or into the future. People need to be comfortable sharing what they've learned. That's a fact. Uh, in my experience, I found Agile to be a good tool for this sort of thing. So uh, Agile ceremonies are all set up, especially Scrum. Uh, here's a diagram. I did not create this diagram, by the way. Whoever did it, I want to give them props. Thank you, image people. Um, but uh, Agile ceremonies are a really good way to look at reflection and iteration. Uh, and I think it's perfect for continuous learning. Most of the ceremonies in Agile uh, are open to the entire team. So anyone can participate. It's encouraged that people participate. So it, it encourages collaboration sharing of ideas, retrospectives in particular are really critical. The entire purpose of that meeting is to facilitate a conversation of what went well and what didn't go well. And then talk about ideas on what people want to do in the next iteration, right? So there's not long, long drawn out feedback loops. You know, there might be a two week sprint and then you learn something in two weeks and then you make some adjustments and you move on. So the iteration is really the key part about, uh, about that because uh, new learnings are applied all the time in a very, uh, you know, without going for months and months and months on end. In my experience, it's also really critical for teams because this open sharing really helps to reduce institutional and tribal knowledge that could be built up by one person on the team, right? Can help with transitioning of team members if you have a project that needs some more help you want to bring other people in, well, there's many people there to help because they're all sharing ideas and talking about stuff all the time. So it's really critical, I think, using these types of ceremonies and, and using Agile is, is a, a, a strength for, for what I'm talking about. Trust. Trust is another key characteristic. Uh, George MacDonald has a nice quote for this. Uh, to be trusted is a greater compliment than being loved. It's pretty strong. I'm not certain I fully agree with that. It's, you know, it's nice to be loved too. But 
If your goal is to bring out the best in other people, it all starts with trusting them. You have to trust them. Great things can happen if you trust people, period. This is about your relationship with other team members. That's really what it comes down to. The relationships are key. They should never be brushed aside for some short-term win. Never. You, if you're working on something and you have a meeting scheduled to help someone else out, you always prioritize that before you finish your commit. You always do. Why? Because that's a priority. Your relationship with your team members is the priority. Let me give you an example of when this didn't work out so well for me. I was participating in a sprint planning meeting and a, a team member wanted a ticket because they felt that they would be able to learn something new. This is a learning opportunity for me. And I saw risk being you know, the technical lead on the project and I decided to assign it to another person. I later learned that my team member felt that I wasn't trusting them to get the work done. And you know what I could have done? I could have given them the work. I could have worked with them. I could have coached them. I could have supported them. And they would have learned from it. To me, that seems like a much better approach that you can do. Uh, Damien McKenna and this kind of guy that's sitting over here, I don't really like him a whole lot, um, posted a, you know, to my Twitter feed and said, a good leader can let things go and delegate. That's what they can do. I responded and I said, you know what, I, I kind of feel like trust is really what you're getting at. And Mr. Urban, of course, in, in his typical fashion, you know, I feel like trust is the single most important thing here. In the final section, we explore some lessons learned. Most of them were hard. Some of them maybe less so, but still important. Presence. I don't think this is, is a natural thing that you associate to a technical leader, but hear me out. If you're a technical leader, you kind of need to recognize that there are points in time that people might be looking up to you. Your presence is critical. It's everything. I believe that good technical leaders communicate thoughtfully and they are capable of recognizing the differences for every single individual that they interact with. Leaders need a vision. They need to be capable of making strategic connections and their presence needs to demonstrate and reflect that vision. You need to embody what it is that you stand for, and what you're trying to do. And if you maintain a vision, and it's a good vision, others will follow you naturally. Uh, so an example here, I knew um, someone on my team wanted to do some pro dev work with uh, React.js. I'm sure many folks in the room like, hey, React's really cool, right? Let's check it out. Um, one thing that I was able to do was I found out that there was some work going on on another project. And I made the connection that we could have that person jump in for a week, do a lot of that learning, deliver something of value to another project that they weren't even on. And I was able to make that happen for them. We invested in her by doing so. We bolstered our own capabilities as a team. And I just needed to be aware and have the presence to make that connection within the organization to make that happen. Hmm. Carrie Fisher. Uh, awesome, awesome community member. Very, very big in the accessibility space. She responded, I recently wrote about cultivating 
positive company culture. I think it also applies to leaders themselves, enforcing work-life balance, making diversity a, pr a priority, being transparent and flexible, but most importantly, listening to people with respect. All of these things are about your presence. Every single thing that she wrote is about presence. <coughs> There's a cool book called The No Asshole Role. I'm sorry. Earmuffs, please. I'm, I'm sorry. I feel so bad. That's just a title. It's a title. Yeah, it's okay. okay. <laughs> um, beyond just your mere presence, it's imperative that technical leaders do not promote or even remotely support any type of toxicity. Robert Sutton explores this phenomenon in a book with a title that I'm not going to repeat right now. He shares his thoughts on just how detrimental toxic behaviors are within a business. Uh, I mean, his book is great. I mean, it, it shares research, institutional data about people leaving organizations, about lowering morale, people being almost you know, shut down by their interactions with people at work. Leaders have a role in promoting a civilized workplace. You just do. This is a responsibility you assume naturally. Instead of blaming others, which can be a, a very divisive thing, or you're positioning people as an us versus them kind of scenario, good leaders, in my mind, try to just listen and empathize. It's my belief from my experience that people should always assume good intentions first. That's the default. I've seen really bad things happen when other people have tried to get ahead at the expense of someone else. That is toxicity right there. A good leader should recognize and try to mediate that toxicity the minute, the second, the moment it occurs. In my experience, this can come up anywhere. This can come up in client meetings, can come up in check-ins, can come up in code, comments, things like that, backlogs, and so much more. People need to be on the lookout for this because it is, can be really, really damaging. One of the next lessons that I've learned, this one was definitely the hard way, is about being informed. It can be really hard to remain informed if you are not actively working on a project. If you're being, you know, if you have, let's suppose, say two hours a week to assist or aid or help out with a project, how do you do that effectively? How do you remain informed? It's very hard to do, but being informed is really critical to making sure that you don't make assumptions about something. You have to be informed. So as an example, let's suppose one of your team members goes over an estimate or they missed a deadline on something. The right move is to get them in a room and try to talk to them and try to understand what happened. You need to listen, and I guarantee you, you will learn something about a challenge they had maybe a personal experience that they didn't know they were going to have or you know that think things happen and most of the time there's things that are really easily fixed you know say hey you know if something came up with your daycare shoot me a note on slack i just want to be aware that something like that happened right it's really easy <laughs> most of these things can be done very very cleanly uh, one, some tips that I've tried to do, I always try to have weekly meetings with project teams and I like to attend the sprint retrospectives. I want to hear people's voices about what their experiences are uh, and, and do so as a team. I want to hear all of that together in concert so I can get diverse perspective. For me personally, I've always maintained an open door policy. I just don't believe in anything otherwise. Um, there are times when I know that I'm busy and I might not always be free right away, but I want people reaching out to me whenever they feel it's important. 
that's because I, I want them to trust me that I can help them if they need it. Uh, and that's just what I try to do. One thing that I've tried to advocate for is something I call the 30 minute rule. If you've been blocked on something for more than 30 minutes, you need to reach out to a peer or <coughs> another individual in the organization to make sure that you get the support you need to move forward. <coughs> do not spin your wheels, do not get that frustrated. 30 minute time block and move on with your life. Another pro tip is being flexible. I will tell you, there are days when I look and I say, man, I really wish I could just be cranking out tickets today. I do have those days. But technical leaders often need to take responsibilities that are way broader, more flexible, and, and anything that you can imagine. You will interact with people throughout you know, your experiences as a technical leader. And those people will have varying skills. They'll have varying backgrounds. They'll have different degrees of technical competency or knowledge. I believe it requires good tech, technical leaders to have superior soft skills and a greater awareness of tailoring your communication to the other people that are receiving your message. You need to be able to communicate technical ideas or concepts or impact to non-technical audiences that may not be able to make the connections that otherwise your team might be able to make or otherwise. Good technical leaders try to communicate things like impact, differences, options that people can expose to empower those they serve to do what they feel is right for them. In my experience, one critical way to communicate, especially with non-technical people, is through visuals. Flow charts, data visualizations, giving really brief demonstrations about interfaces or anything like that, screenshots, all of these are really great ways, not super technical, that you can visually communicate ideas. Get the idea across, right? That's all you need to do. But you need to be flexible in how it is that you interact with other people if you ever want to make it as a technical lead in this world, period. Uh, this is like one of my, you know, kind of like go-to quotes, you know, in day-to-day. -day and, I'm, uh, you know, I might be doing a task that I, you know, didn't realize I was going to be doing that day. And I always come back and I say, no job is ever beneath you. If you're asking someone else to do something, you should be very comfortable doing it yourself. That establishes trust. So the flexibility concept applies to the work itself. If you have a fixed perspective of what you view your job being as a technical leader, I guarantee you, you're going to be surprised. Based on the number of situations I've been involved in and the diversity of the people that I've interacted with, you will probably find yourself working in a number of different areas throughout the business. Tickets, testing, technical architecture research, mentoring people, professional development, business analysis, sales work, estimations, you name it. It's all on the table. You should be comfortable performing any of this type of work because the rest of your team does. It's, it's that's that simple. This helps to promote empathy and it gives you the perspective you need to relate to people. So recently I actually uh, had to do a deployment for one of the engineers on my team that was out sick. And you know, for months I had been hearing that uh, you know, every time I do a deployment on this project it's super painful. <laughs> this environment, these environments are really crappy. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Guess what? Once I saw it firsthand, I'm like, wow, this is painful. Can't believe I've ever asked this person to do this. This is really, oh, man, let's get the memory increased on this. Come on. I realized at that moment in time, I did not have empathy for the people doing the work.
Next topic. Evolve. Evolve. Sounds like a gladiator thing. Evolve. Change is inevitable. Would you all agree? I hope so. Technology changes, staff changes, businesses change, focuses change, the world changes. Doesn't matter what you do. Leaders, I believe, need to adapt to that change. And they need to try not to promote FUD. Fear, unknown, and doubt. Try not to promote it. In these types of roles, people may look up to you as being someone capable of being stable when the rest of the world around them could be changing. Change can be very hard on people. And having that perspective is really key. Uh, Leo Biscaglia. God, I probably butchered that last name. I'm so sorry, Leo. Change is the end result of true learning. While change is hard, it's actually necessary. It is a critical thing in how we work. Technical leaders need to be capable of adapting to this change on the fly and all the time. Strategies can change, vision can change, but all of this needs to make sure it is capable of changing. In my experience, try not to change too much at one time. Try to do so incrementally. Try not to make it so drastic or significant. If you're making major changes, do so gradually, nice and easy. Listen to others so that you're hearing what their concerns are. Make sure that they're capable of giving you feedback on how the change is impacting them. I guarantee you they will feel much more supported and they will be much more invested in the change that you all are facing. All right, so, hey. I came up through the ranks computer science degree, technical coder, everything like that. But guess what? Now I've learned that in doing the work that I've done, you can be substantially more effective if you have or maintain an awareness of business related factors. I tried to avoid it, right? Um, but really that's just something you need to be present to. This is healthy. This is not something people should shy away from. This is healthy. Try to be informed about what makes good decisions in your company. And that could be about the broader business landscape or anything like that. The real key is it helps you to make better situational decisions. You have more awareness. If you know a project is going, you know, has a tight budget, you may be a little less inclined to take a risk on it. it. Might not be the right opportunity, right? One example that I, I've seen this a number of times is you might have a request come through from a, a product owner if you're working with someone and it wasn't written into the contract. How do you juggle that? So I think one of the key things is really trying to come up with a set of strategies on how you process that within your business. <laughs> Have the awareness of what you do to escalate that to maybe other people in the company like your salesman who worked with the client when they was in the sales phase or otherwise. You need to know how to manage those situations so that you handle it thoughtfully and that you look and say, hey, we can give you a contract amendment or um, we can postpone this until a later phase of work. Your key should be making sure that you help come up with the right technical strategies and you have the awareness to pick up on things when it's before it gets off the rails. So here we go. You know who this is. This is your typical salesman. All right. And as a technical person, this is what I see when I see salesmen. I've changed my perspective slightly, but really, okay, let's be real here. I want to challenge all of you to recognize that this person is a person too. 
they're not just selling you, you know, a 1987 uh, old Cadillac, right? You have a tremendous opportunity as a technical leader to help make sure that this person is selling the right thing. It's going to help your team, right? You can mitigate a problem before a contract is even signed if what is sold is more effective. This can be hugely beneficial to your entire organization and it can mitigate risk. So don't avoid them. Lend them a hand. All right. Technical sexiness versus pragmatism. There is always going to be a balance between learning and using cool new technology and the pragmatic view of what impact that has on the work you're doing. I will tell you, there are many, many countless innovative new tools that are out there in the space, and you all know that firsthand. These things need learned, they need explored, they need to be matured. Maybe they're not there yet. As a community, we also have a responsibility for maturing and using and innovating. That's the balance that we all face. And that's what makes Drupal sustainable and all the open source projects that we work with. For me, I believe that technical leaders must recognize and balance innovation without taking huge risks. It's a balance. Use the right tool for the right job, period. Barrett, uh, one of my buddies, he's a cool guy. A, a good tech lead loves new technology, but approaches it with caution. A bad one loves it to abandon and goes all in too readily. Yeah, I think that sums it up pretty well. Andrew Hunt and Dave Thomas, they wrote a book called The Pragmatic Programmer. I feel like this is like one of those key pieces of like, aha, you know, moments that I've had in my career. Where I read this like 10 years ago, I believe, and was like, wow, that's a good book. So The Pragmatic Programmer discusses pragmatism in the work that we do as technologists. Pragmatism is about sensibility and practicality in the work. He uh, talks a lot about some different concepts in this book. One is called software rot. And I could summarize my opinion on what software rot is, and it's really about making thoughtful architectural choices. Good architectural choices can make or break the work that you're doing. Why? You should try to limit complexity, and you should appreciate the simplicity because things can easily change, things can evolve, and you don't have to go and refactor millions of lines of code to remove the vast amounts of complexity you might have built into something. This helps solutions scale with time if you use that mentality. One other key thing is around cutting corners. I have never, it has never worked out for me or any team that I've worked on to do that. You always end up regretting it, period. In all the work that you do, you should be promoting quality because it will come back to haunt you. And it usually comes back to haunt you in ways that you don't want it to and your users will always get upset. What do you mean you built me something that I can't change this text field on this page? Ugh. Quality can be increased with automation, which produces predictable processes, and really strong testing practices. The book talks about this concept of testing ruthlessly and effectively as being a key metric for quality. But I believe, to be pragmatic, we all need to remove our individual biases 
or our preferences for what we want to see happen. And we need to make the choice to best serve other people, whatever that looks like. Small acts, when multiplied by millions of people, can transform the world. That was written by Howard Zinn. Remember, as technical leaders, you look at every interaction as you have, uh, that you have as an opportunity to improve something, improve another person, improve a process, improve a technology. Imagine the collective impact that we all could have if we truly honored that perspective. I want to thank you all very much. I really enjoyed being here, and I hope you had a great time.